First of all, let me welcome you to this last Humanities Forum event of the fall semester. I am Rebecca Bowling, and I'm the director <coughs> of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. Our spring schedule for the Humanities Forum will be up on the Drescher Center website by the end of next week, so please visit our website to see all the exciting speakers we have planned for next semester. James Counts Early has served in various positions at the Smithsonian Institution, including as Assistant Provost for Educational and Cultural Programs and Assistant Secretary for Education and Public Service. Prior to his work with the Smithsonian, Mr. Early was an administrator at the National Endowment for Humanities, <coughs> producer, writer, and host of 10 Minutes Left, a weekly radio segment of cultural, educational, and political interviews and commentary at WHUR-FM Radio at Howard University, and a research associate for programs and documentation at the Howard University Institute for the Arts and Humanities. He is a longtime advocate and activist for cultural diversity and equity issues in both national and international cultural and educational institutions. He has explored the implications of culture, ethnicity, nationality, capitalism, and socialism in constructions of statecraft and democratic institutions. The main focus of his professional work is cultural democracy and the development of cultural heritage policy. His service on boards includes the International Network for Cultural Diversity, Trans-Africa Forum, the Institute for Policy Studies, and Telezor. He did graduate work in Latin American and Caribbean history with a minor in African and African American history at Howard. He's currently the Director of Cultural Heritage Policy at the Smithsonian. Today's lecture is co-sponsored with the Language, Literacy, and Culture PhD program and the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. So my thanks to both of those programs. The title of James Early's lecture is Social Movements and Participatory Cultural Democracy in Latin America and the US in a Time of Crises. Please join me in welcoming Mr. James Count Early. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know it's late on a cloudy day, and um, I just saw all of you walk in, and I thought, wow, this must be a very popular topic. But then I did see uh, sheets going around, so <laughs> I'm sure there is a bit of uh, obligatory participation here. Um, I, I am very pleased to be here for a number of reasons. One, um, to be back with an old friend and activist um, colleague, uh, Dr. Beverly Bickle. Um, we go way back when um, my kids were really kids and who are now 35 and 31, and although hers are somewhat younger. Oh, you can't, okay. Let me start again. Um, I'm very pleased for a number of reasons to be here. Um, one particular reason has to do with a long time friendship and uh, activist history with Dr. Beverly Bickle. Um, the other is whenever I come on this campus, and I've come on this campus several times, uh, and I've been on many universities uh, and campuses throughout the United States and from around the world, uh, there is a um, sense of a kind of jewel box of education when I see uh, physically, I, I come to the hilltop circle and this concentration of buildings, uh, there seems to be something uh, special going on here, and um, I indeed hope there is, and I hope that you young adults uh, will take that observation seriously and take uh, full advantage of um, being on this campus and being involved in the humanities. Um, the humanities now uh, really set context for what is going on in literally every life-defining aspect of the world, in every uh, geographical area, uh, every um, cultural dimension of life. Um, I stress that because uh, historically the humanities have been seen more as sort of the soft professional areas. Um, one wants to be a lawyer, or a doctor, or a dentist, an economist, a banker, uh, perhaps um, issues of military might and the like have been seen as the more substantive and certainly the, the sciences and technology have been seen as the more substantive areas. 
But I want to suggest to you today, and what is really more of a talk than it will be a lecture, um, the significance um, of the humanities, uh, history in particular, the bedrock of the humanities, because uh, everything in life uh, takes place in a sense of time and place. Uh, even when you're looking at the history of the atom, uh, you really have to go back and not look at it simply as a scientific phenomena, but you have to see what people were thinking, what they understood. Uh, so history frames uh, every discipline, and uh, it is the bedrock um, of the humanities. As I said, this is going to be a talk rather than a lecture. And one of the reasons I want to do a talk is because I want to suggest to you that in this culturally diverse world, uh, the notion of a lecture or a dialogue is um, not unimportant, uh, but it is very limited uh, in a world in which uh, people are arguing for multivocality, uh, cultural diversity, pluralism, uh, different ways of knowing and doing uh, that have been evolved over historical time around the same common issues, but what makes them different is the notion of culture, uh, gender being one of those issues. Uh, race is a... Just one second. Okay. We realize we don't have the mic turned on. Yeah. Ah. It's probably, in the, it's probably in your pocket. It's that little box. We thought that we maybe needed to turn it. Okay, this is the camera mic. This is, uh, this is the camera mic. Where's the other mic? Okay. Ah, is that it? That's it. You might need to wear two mics. <laughs> I guess you're going to be wired. Okay, does that make any difference? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Um, I mean, I have to hear my own voice now. Um, so that in this, in this um, era in which issues of diversity or pluralism um, are quite resonant uh, in societies, uh, the notion of a lecture or a dialogue, be they important, are somewhat limited. And so I want to uh, suggest to you that the notion of a multi-log, multi-logical, different ways of knowing and doing, uh, coming from different uh, evolved uh, historical perspectives about life, what is good, truth, and beautiful in one culture is not what is good, truth, and beautiful in another culture. Uh, the uh, sensitivities about gender and uh, sense of self uh, varies from culture to culture. So they, one cannot just talk about men or women because they are very diverse as categories, rural, urban. Now, I suggest to you this issue of a multi-log because uh, I'm going to talk uh, for a brief while, which is very difficult for me because I'm used to talking very long and I enjoy talking a lot because I have a lot, I think, to say. But your turn will come because learning really does need to be multi-logical. Uh, it should not just be those of us who claim to have expertise and experience saying to you, open up your ears and heads and let me give you the truth. Uh, truth really is a negotiated I issue, and it's one of your own uh, articulation, not just your questioning or your inquiry. So I'm not into questioning and answering periods. You might raise questions. I certainly will respond to them. But I'm very interested in your own commentary, including your own critiques uh, about what will be raised here today. And I hope that you will find something uh, stimulating, uh, even provocative, uh, that you might take away and continue to reflect on as you prepare yourselves uh, to go out uh, into this world, uh, which is a world of crisis. Uh, when Beverly uh, Bickle and I talked about this about a year ago, I was, um, as I generally am, very much focused on what is going on in Latin America. Uh, I will give a rationale as to why I look at Latin America, but I want to suggest to you that the issues that I'm going to raise about crisis and cultural, participatory cultural democracy are issues that are quite resonant all over the world. Uh, I know that not only by reading, uh, but because I'm out of the country at least once a month, probably 15 times a year, and I travel uh, literally all over. Uh, since the fall, I've been in Germany and the UK and uh, Bermuda where I'm working with them on the development of a national cultural heritage plan. Um, in um, Africa, I just returned last week from Beijing and on Thursday I'm headed to Ecuador to deal with Afro-Latins, uh, um, 
Some of you may know that there are 150 million descendants of Africa in Latin America, uh, with the largest group of African descendants outside of the country of Nigeria uh, being in Brazil, somewhere between 80 and 100 million uh, Afro-Brazilians um, worshiping West African gods that can still be found in Benin and Nigeria. Uh, these are not marginalized relig religions, indeed. They are the dominant religions. And I leave Quito uh, next um, Sunday, and then I head to, uh, to Cuba, where there are also these issues of um, cultural diversity and democracy. But let me start with the crisis. We are in a global financial crisis. I want to suggest to you that there is uh, something uh, prior to looking at this as a financial crisis, and that is a crisis of ethics. Um, when you read whatever uh, newspaper or watch whatever media or social media that you're involved in, uh, you will uh, frequently see that there is a statement that the system failed. Well, systems really uh, do not exist independently of human beings. Uh, human beings fail. Uh, there is much greed going on in this world. Uh, there is much gambling uh, with the lives of uh, citizens going on all over the world. And so we really have to start with what is it uh, about this failure that um, needs to be addressed first? And that is one of values. The notion that there is one way of organizing society um, has crashed. This is a world dominated by an economic system called capitalism, based on supply and demand, uh, in which uh, corporations uh, uh, who are legally seen as entities or individuals, uh, the logic is that if they're healthy, you are healthy. Well, that's not true. When they gambled away um, their money and then went on the public dole of a trillion dollars here in the United States, uh, we now know, and you can go check this out on your computers this evening, uh, that they are paying back the government. Uh, they are making profits. Uh, but you can't get loans. Um, your student loans are difficult to come by. Um, so that when they are healthy, it is not true that we are healthy. Something is wrong with the ethics of that system. And we're seeing reactions to that going on all around the world. And perhaps the most dynamic uh, level of reaction at scale, uh, which is more than just a critique of what has been going on, but which is a search for a new way, or new ways, plural, of organizing society, is taking place at level of scale in Latin America. Now, don't just think Hugo Chavez. Uh, I happen to have spent some quality time with him over the years, particularly talking about issues of race. Or just don't think Evo Morales, the first indigenous uh, leader who is also a socialist. I spent a little time with him. Or don't just think uh, the Castro brothers. I've spent a little time with one of them, Fidel Castro, back in September. Think Brazil, the eighth largest economy in the world. How many of you have heard of the BRIC countries, the B-R-I-C countries? Anybody? Only a few hands. OK, while you're Twittering and linking in, and um, I don't know what else is out there, uh, check out some of this information. Brazil is the eighth largest economy in the world. They produce steel. Uh, over half of their cars run on ethanol uh, from sugarcane. Um, they have a very young population. They have one of the most unequal uh, distributions of income um, in the world. And as I've noted earlier, uh, at least half the population are Afro-descendants, which is not simply a question of color, but it's a question of culture ways of knowing and doing, learned behavior. Skin color does not think. It may provoke us to think or to give certain value. But ways of knowing and doing, which is a simple way of looking at culture, is informed uh, by these Africanisms of the practitioners of Yoruba religion from West Africa called Candomblé, which is quite pervasive in Brazil alongside Catholicism, and increasingly a, a dominant push on the part of Protestants. I say think Brazil because 
Lula, who is, came from a poor, very, very marginalized background, he's a very white Brazilian, uh, arose after numerous occasions trying to become president, to become president of the Workers' Party. He's leaving government uh, with an 84% rating. He is now the interlocutor between Latin America and the United States, uh, between Latin America and Western Europe, and between Latin America and the South. In his first term, he went to Africa 17 times. Uh, that had to do with petroleum. Brazil has the third largest uh, oil reserve in the world. Venezuela has the first largest oil reserve in the world. Between Ecuador and um, Bolivia, there's something between 13 and 16 percent uh, of the world's uh, natural gas. Um, in Argentina, uh, which is the <laughs> fastest growing economy despite crises they've had in Latin America, it's not the largest, but it's the fastest growing, uh, they rank one, one, three, two in the world's grains. It's a virtual breadbasket of the world. Uh, the largest um, sweet water reserve in the world is in Paraguay. Um, cattle, uh, beef are all over. Latin America. So you can see that this is quite a dynamic region. And this is a region uh, that is involved in integration. And wh why is that integration being propelled? Well, it is rejecting what is called the neoliberal paradigm, which is the paradigm that has emanated from here in the United States. Uh, that's an expression of the free market uh, in the late 20th century, early 21st century. And basically what the neo neoliberal paradigm does at an empirical level, that is at a descriptive level, it calls for less government support for the quality of life and more dependence on the marketplace. Uh, this is the debate about whether you should privatize Social Security or whether you should all just go out and get your individual medical doctors and not let the government tell you uh, what doctors you can go to. Um, it is less regulation and, uh, over uh, those who are producing goods and services in life um, with the sense that if you restrict them, they are not able to produce the quality products that we want uh, so that we have these oil spills and uh, we have China sending in these uh, dangerous toys that children are using because our regulatory measures, uh, which the state is supposed to carry out, are not being done. These are some of the descriptions of what is called the neoliberal paradigm. Well, the counter to that is going on in Latin America among these very mixed ideological communities in what they call the integration of Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, history has a lot to do with this. Who knows who the, what, what country was the first country to dispute uh, Spanish colonialism uh, in Latin America? Anybody? Venezuela was the first country to defeat Spain and its colonial empire. But what was the country in the Caribbean connected to Latin America that preceded Venezuela with a revolution? Haiti. Haiti. Where did Bolivar, who led the revolution in Venezuela, go when he needed men and boats? He went to Haiti to talk to Dessalines. He says, I need men and boats to start a revolution against Spain. Dessalines said, well, what will you do about slavery? He says, I will abolish slavery. Well, he went back with men and boats. He was defeated. He did not abolish slavery. Where did he go when he had to go into exile? Anybody know? He went to Jamaica, the famous letter from Jamaica. Now. Bolivar's view in defeating Spain, because he was involved in the defeat of Spain in Ecuador and Bolivia and what was called Gran Colombia, which was all connected to Panama. Those of you who might be interested in this, it is indeed worth reading because the spirit, that is those values that were placed down at that historical moment, now animate the present moment of integration of Latin America in the Caribbean in the context of this global crisis. And so that is why when you see these forums of uh, multilateral bodies or uh, presidential gatherings in Latin America now, you're increasingly seeing 
sitting with those Latin American leaders, those continental Latin American leaders, you're seeing Preval from Haiti, or you're seeing two or three other representatives from the Afro-Anglo-speaking uh, Caribbean. Uh, this is a historical project uh, that is reawakening in the moment. Uh, this also has to do with cultural diversity. Because in this motion uh, of the integration of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, as the United States has argued historically an American exceptionalism, God has blessed us. Well, would you think that God would bless everybody? Why just us? But we have had that narrative, God has blessed us. Uh, Latin Americans are now saying, but we have a different kind of history, uh, different kinds of values, and we should not just try to emulate the United States or the West. We must draw on our own imagery, historically evolved, on our own religious perspectives, on our own linguistic perspectives. This is where the notion of a multi-log, a multi-vocal comes in. This is where the notion um, of in real politic, a plural world, not a monocultural world, or a multipolar world, not a superpower world. So out of this crisis now, Latin America as a region is trying to search. It is searching of how to squeeze more democracy, and I'll come to the term democracy in a moment, out of the existing capitalist paradigm uh, that is a better social welfare state where there is more of a balance of what social products uh, or benefits go to citizens while corporations make money, uh, rather than this rampant, uh, rapacious system that we have seen where we'll just make all the money that we possibly can, and the fact that you're losing your homes is really of no consequence to us. Uh, you are the, re the reason, you are the, the problem of having come and taken out these loans that you could not sustain. Well, somebody put a bowl of sugar in front of you and you went to take that sugar and then they said, well, no, you're, the problem is that you're the greedy one, uh, but we're gonna take your house anyway. They're trying to restrike that balance uh, by building their own institutions, the Bank of the South being one of those. Uh, when oil was $75 a barrel, Venezuela was selling uh, in its petro Carib project uh, oil to the Caribbean for $25 a barrel. So they were making their money. I think Venezuela is probably the third or the fourth largest oil supplier to the United States. But they were making their money off the big countries and they were building a solidarity relationship with these smaller countries. It's saying, okay, uh, I'm going to sell you oil at $25 a barrel. You owe me, what is that, $35? Uh, I'll give you 25 years to pay for it. I want to know over those 25 years how much money have you put into education, into nursing, uh, into medicine, into building homes. Uh, that is a solidarity aid relationship uh, going on for the integration of Latin America. Uh, the search for alternatives, the Bank of the South, of saying we no longer want to rely on the World Bank and these structural adjustment programs uh, that have us cutting social services to citizens uh, so that we have these uh, high statistical gross national products, but the quality of life is going down. That's what you call gambling. That's a kind of statistical portrait where things look good, but the quality of life is going down. And then there are the discussions about 21st century socialism, which I don't want to dwell too on because I'm not here to try to convert you to anything. I'm here to try to provoke you to think about your citizenship as young adults and how you are going to take some responsibility for repositioning the United States of America in a more equitable relationship with the rest of the world, uh, which has turned on us. And if you don't believe that they've turned on us, just look at the polls in Western Europe. You don't have to go to the Middle East, uh, to Islamic countries, or you don't have to talk about racism. Just, just look at Western Europeans who are very frustrated and upset. I'm talking about middle class people, not marginalized people. And so your challenge, uh, unfortunately, we have left this challenge to you. Uh, we've so mucked up uh, circumstances that we are isolated in the world. So that's what I want you to think about when I'm raising these issues. But let me do say a word about 21st century socialism, and this ties to the issue of democracy as well. 
if we think about democracy uh, in the way that the Greeks thought about it, and I prefer to use that very simple uh, bifurcation of the term, uh, demos, the people, kratos, power. Power to the people was my generational slogan. I'm, I'm 63 years old. You know, we were out power to the people. Um, what is power to the people? It is the right and the obligation of every citizen to speak her mind, to say what he thinks in the public space among these diverse individuals as we all negotiate what our national identity is. Our national identity does not supplant our racial identity, our ethnic identity, our linguistic identity, our sexual identity, or the fact that we are rural and urban. We have, postmodernism allowed us to uh, get a glimpse of this, we have multiple identities. You know? I'm a man, I'm a black man, I'm a father, I'm an atheist, I'm a number of things, and so are you a number of things. We are not just one thing. Multivocality, there are many dimensions of us that need to come out in this negotiation in the public space. So in this search for democracy vis-a-vis -vis socialism in Latin America, when Hugo Chavez, um, who is, um, came to power uh, now 10, 11 years ago, he's what is called a mestizo, uh, which is a mixture of European, Spanish European, uh, and Indian, uh, although he will say to you his grandmother was black, so he's become very racially conscious. He's been heard to say on national public radio, you see these big lips and you see this curly hair, that's Mother Africa. Well, he's opened nine to 12 new embassies in Africa with people who look like me because of the almost 40 million Venezuelans, somewhere between seven and 10 million of them identify as Afro-Venezuelans. Uh, they are people of dark hue, but more importantly, many of them have ways of knowing and doing that can be traced back to these historically evolved perspectives, which is called culture, in Africa. There are over 80 drums in Venezuela that can be traced to distinct areas of Africa. And I've seen the little children being trained in them, and I've seen the 80-year-old women wearing African prints singing the African National Anthem. There is no such thing as the African National Anthem. They are singing the South African Anthem, but they are age of TV. They know that something called Africa exists, uh, but some of them may think that Africa is a country, uh, not a continent of 2,000, uh, at least 2,000 languages uh, of the 7,000 language, 7,300 and somewhat languages that still exist. Issues of diversity. So Hugo Chavez says, 21st century socialism must be democratic. Now that sounds odd for my generation because democracy and capitalism go together. They are seen to be synonymous. Democracy is not to fit with any other word. But if we go back to the simple uh, proposition of the Greeks, demos, the people, kratos, the power, people's power, uh, that is a human issue in whatever socioeconomic system one develops. So today in Cuba, how many of you have been to Cuba? Most of you are too young to have been to Cuba. Ah, who are Cuban Americans in here? Okay, uh, there is a huge democratic struggle. You would not know that by listening to Fox News, but nor would you know it by reading the Washington Post. Uh, so you can look at either extreme. And what does Raul Castro's daughter say? Uh, she's 40-some years old. She runs a sex education center, um, very well-educated person, loves her father, Raul Castro. And she is heard to say and seen to publish on numerous occasions that the biggest problem in this country today is the lack of citizen participation, a participatory democracy, an engaged citizenship, saying, I don't like this. I would like to have that. Uh, even I demand this or that. Now that can take place in a capitalist system or it can take place in a socialist system. And both of them have histories in varying degrees, and I don't want to ar argue uh, equality here because they're not quite equal, of repression. It is very interesting uh, in this moment in the United States, the same neoliberal paradigm, less role of the state in the quality of our lives, it's not just happening, but outside between the United States and other countries. It's happening inside. 
well, we've got more surveillance uh, going on in this country. I, I will, when I was at Dulles last week going to Beijing, uh, I was not uh, frisk, but I'll be going out of national on Thursday. And um, I'm not even sure frisk is the proper word. Uh, but a sort of interim summary here is what I want to suggest is that out of this crisis of ethics, of how do we provide a quality opportunity for people to be actively engaged, not simply be represented? How do we uh, design an economic system that actually produces for people uh, to be able to enhance the material quality of their lives? How do we set up a system in which, I don't like the word tolerance, I don't, like, I don't want to tolerate anybody, but that is open to plural expressions of spirituality or religion our sexual orientation uh, such that I don't say to you, I'm better because I'm Christian and you are not as good because you're a Muslim. Uh, these are the challenging questions that you face. Now you have some options. You can either begin to be, use your imaginations, uh, m not much of what we do in this country. We don't really like to talk about the imagination outside of that, the professions of art, you know, musicians, plastic artists, dancers. But we need you to use your imaginations as citizens, as bankers, as people who will run corporations, as people who will develop curriculum or become presidents of universities, uh, to think about how we're going to create new plural worlds, not just one world. Or we can resort, as the social movement of the Tea Party has, back to these old saws, these old propositions, that they have the equation of how to do it. And we can end up, uh, as we're seeing now, with very negative, uh, intense relations between citizens of this country. Uh, if you are a Latina or a Latino, um, you can easily be profiled. That debate is going on. Some people believe you have the right to do that. If, you're, if your accent does not sound like mine, then you are not equal to me. Uh, you are suspect, and I'm less suspect. When I'm on the telephone, I've had people say to me, oh, when they meet me, oh, I thought you were white because I don't sound like whatever a black person is supposed to sound like. But if you are on that phone with an accent, then they know you are from their vantage point and others. So you have that option to either stick with these old paradigms that have brought us in crisis, or you have the option to use this moment of your education to take the humanities in particular, which is really about how people have historically become human, the ways people have expressed their humanity, and the ongoing process of refining how you expand what humanness means. Uh, the gay and lesbian question uh, is one of those ethical issues in this crisis that in the US military uh, we're still trying to debate. But it is advancing as a democratic question. I really am not trying to convince you what you should personally think, but I am saying to you that in the public space, you've got to use your imagination about multivocality, different ways of knowing and doing. And then when you go to your private space, you do what you do privately. So this moment uh, of, of crisis um, is one that opens up the opportunity for a participatory cultural democracy. Now, that term can sound like it's, it's all positive. Uh, I reference the Tea Party and I reference Latin America. I would say by and large that the movements in Latin America are positive democratic attempts. There is no guarantee that they will succeed. They have to be assessed. But so is the Tea Party, a participatory democracy process which is saying that I don't want to elect you just to have you represent me. I want to be involved in the day-to-day -day way of the representation. The election of Barack Obama was before they demobilized their base, and much of that base was your cohort age group, uh, Twittering, linking in, uh, I'm not sure what else one does on these social net networks, um, was an act a participatory democracy that I want to be involved in real time. I don't want to simply be involved in a theater where um, every two or four years I get an opportunity to vote and call that democracy and then I come back and complain and have to select somebody else. Participation is what is, uh, people are attempting to do um, around the world. 
So where do we go from here? That really depends on your generational group. And I want to suggest some things before I wind down to open up for you to be, get involved in this multi-log. How many of you know more than one language? How many of you know more than three languages or speak more than three languages? Considerable drop. How many speak four languages or five languages? I see three hands. Now, when I go to um, Johannesburg, where I'll be going in January for the African Union's meeting on the sixth region, diaspora is the sixth region, I'll get in a taxi and I'll meet a young woman or a young man that may have finished sixth grade and may speak six, seven, eight languages. Uh, but no one has ever said to her or to him how bright they are. I won't ask the uh, PhD professors here um, how many of them actually speak uh, or write in uh, the two languages that they were required to do for PhDs because it might be uh, an embarrassment to, to us all. But we know uh, the syndrome. You've got to learn other ways of knowing and doing. And that is the basis for making deep comparisons in the global public space. You don't have to accept all of who I am. But you have to approach me with respect and appreciation uh, that I have grown up a certain kind of way. Again, not my skin color, my ways of knowing and doing. And then in the negotiation of that space, and I'll give you an example uh, of the negotiation of that space, that is how we build our common identity as a vibrant, living, democratic identity. Many years ago, when I was your age, I had to ride on segregated buses. And people says, well, you know, I will never live next to one of those. And now, you know, I see them carrying around their little brown grandbabies. Uh, that comes out of a negotiation. People, people, people grew. Our speak English. This is America. Now every right-wing, left-wing, green, centrist, liberal politician is trying to say, yo hablo espanol. Um, that is a negotiation. And that is how identity changes. And that gets to this issue of a kind of multi-vocalness. Uh, uh, that's what social networks are about. It's horizontal integration. It's not centralized dissemination. You get on, you make your comment. Somebody around the world makes another comment. They come from all angles. So learn another language so that you can be uh, in this global arena, in the way that your cohort group in Western Europe in particular, uh, in the European Union as young adults like yourselves, you know, are traveling all around in these hostile communities. Um, we see a few hostels around the U.S., but not in the way that we see it in Europe. Uh, Latin Americans, because of the economic situation, these unnatural migrations are moving north and moving west. Uh, the Association of Latin Americans, uh, you can find them all over Europe. Africans, they're more new African Americans. We, we have not negotiated what the nominative uh, terminology will be, but they are not new immigrants. I'm talking about those who have come since the 1965 Immigration Act, which allowed more non-Europeans to enter this country, uh, who are now third generation, have grandchildren. They look like me. Many of them are Protestants, but they don't necessarily psychologically feel like me. Uh, many of them, solid working class, not just the rich, send their children home to be trained in Africa. So they know urban Africa, rural village Africa. They speak their, the tongue of their grandparents, and they speak and write English better than most African Americans who are descendants of enslaved Africans here. So there's new thinking going on, and this is a part of the cultural democracy issue. And you can become multicultural. My generation thought that meant multiracial. You know, you're white, I'm black. Well, that doesn't really tell us a whole lot. Are you German American? Are you Slovak American? Are you Irish American? Uh, those are the cultural questions, uh, not the skin color questions. So my sister here, you know 
we look alike, but uh, my sister there. But we probably culturally are very, very different. Uh, language will be one way um, in to that. And let me just stop then on um, this one. I had some quotes from Lula and whatnot that I will not read, but I will just reference. This is a struggle um, trying to get out of this crisis about fairness and about justice. Well, that's a new way of looking at power. And one of the things that um, Lula da Silva, the former president of Brazil, tells us, and you're going to see him on the global stage, is that we must look to the continent of Africa and we must look to Latin America because these are the most dynamic economies in the world. I'll say one word about, about China in terms of regions. They're some of the poorest areas of the world, but this is where the growth potential is. And so that as you think about your professions and who you're going to engage and where you may locate, you really have to think about the fairness justice issues with regard to those continents. But because the degree to which they do not develop, it's going to be a tax on you. And you see that tax in these absurd wars, uh, this debate about Iran now. You must pay a lot of attention and you must raise your voice about this. Um, what's going on in uh, Korea now is another issue uh, that you should bring these humanity skills. Um, presumably, most of you are studying humanities. I know some of you are going to be big time bankers and stockbrokers and um, big time tech people. Uh, but the humanities is a context for, for all of that. So uh, look to the one word about China. Anybody in here studying Mandarin? Anybody in here speaks Mandarin? Well, I've been to China three times now, and I was joking the other day. I said, so how, was, how was Beijing? I said, there were Chinese everywhere. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, I think it's a city of about 25 million. Uh, and I met these young adults in their 20s and early 30s, most of them like the young adult women I see in this room. They are impressive. They're speaking English. Um, I went into the stores. I sp spent some time in Japan years ago on a US Japan Society fellowship back in the 80s. And it made me think of Japan. Um, I, I looked at these um, highly European clothes, expensive clothes, the consumerism that's going on. Uh, but I thought there are over a billion Chinese. And while they are learning English, your generation, some of you need to start learning Chinese if you're going to engage. English is the lingua franca of the world, and you can go anywhere with it, and you should be proud of that, but you should not be totally comfortable with that. Because ways of knowing and doing, that's what languages express about the same human condition, but different nuances, different angles of interpretation uh, that's where the fine poetic issues of the humanities come in. Uh, that's where the deep issues of interpretation uh, come in. And so I, I would suggest to you that that is your challenge. And I've probably spoken a little longer and not hit all of the cogent points that I want. But uh, it's your turn. And so I want to hear from you. You may want to critique something or reject something that I said. That's your democratic right, and you should always express that. You should always let your voice be heard. You may have questions, or you simply may have comments. But your turn. Yes, ma'am. Um, what you were saying about the role of the humanities, um, and I just thought I'd comment, it actually reminded me of a reading I did for a class last year that was saying that the humanities was a safeguard of democracy. You want to elaborate a little for us? It was just basically saying that without people, that people who studied the humanities basically were watchdogs in the same way as the media. And they were able to say, like, when, the, when the, um, things were happening, I read this a very long time ago, um, that shouldn't be happening, or the, see the same mistakes that the government made, or a different government made you know, a long time ago, and say, wait a second, we shouldn't do that again. Or see the signs of corruption happening um, in a government 
So in one regard, you, you, what you may be suggesting or what might be concluded um, from the examples that you just gave is the importance of history here. It allows us to look into the mirror of time and to try to figure out what did the image really look at, like? What were the causative factors? Uh, what were the characteristics that were expressed under some situation or another? And it may look the same today, but are the causative factors different? So that's one. I would also suggest to you that with regard to uh, the humanities, um, how many in here uh, write poetry? OK, I know there are a few secret poets. Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> OK, how many of you in here read poetry on a regular basis? Okay. How many of you dance, including social dance, not just the fine forms? Like, all right. That, uh, how many of you go to galleries? I know there's a gallery right downstairs here. I didn't get a chance to go into it. Okay. This is where the imagination allows us to think about new possibilities. You know, an intellectual, well-known intellectuals, uh, most often have to write a number of books before they are acclaimed, although now we have this thing called the public intellectual, which I think is a little too theatrical and performative. <laughs> and so uh, that has opened up a whole new, new dimension. But a poet can write one poem and take us places that we never read before or thought before, or it can unsettle us in ways as never before. That's a part of safeguarding in the sense that if you safeguard something and it becomes static, it dies. Those are principles of science. Those are also principles of societies. Uh, but if the imagination can take the virtues of what has been historically evolved, the values that have allowed a community to be wholesome, if the imagination can take that in this moment and not just be stuck in time, it can open up whole new possibilities. When you walk into a gallery and you see a shade of blue, it may stick with you for months, even as you are burdened with other hardships, economic, family, whatnot. That's a discussion that we need to have in this country. Um, our Constitution said for the pursuit of happiness, but there are no policies. So I'm a former board member of Americans for the Arts. Um, I left and discussed. They were pleased. but um, <laughs> Because their main slogan was, art equals jobs. Uh, this, is how, this is where the market orientation dominates everything. Well, how many artists do you know who actually go into art because they want to really be rich? Now, I know there are these new film people. I have a 31-year-old. Uh, we have a 31-year-old, a master's degree in theater, uh, writes scripts, does movies uh, on stage all the time, making no money, very bright. But you know he's, he, he's not going to be happy if he's not doing his imagination, if his muse is not being fed. So these are the issues of well-being, uh, which has to do with the humanities and culture and the different angles of interpretation. What makes us different as humans are the ways we do culture. We are culture-producing beings. We, we say that in some. Uh, some distinction to other parts of the animal kingdom, which we don't fully understand. We're learning a little more about porpoises and so forth. And so who knows? It may turn out to be they may be far more intelligent and, and obviously peaceful since they haven't tried to kill us off. But yes, I think you have a point. <laughs> yes, sir.
make it seem that not wanting to know more or learn more about any other countries or learn more about the various topics is some type of, is like a virtue as opposed to gaining greater cultural awareness mm -hmm. in terms of other cultures. So how do people, my question is, how do people that may agree with the idea that cultural diversity and pluralism is important for a sustained democracy, how do they counteract those influences from other groups that are telling people that it's okay to just live in your bubble? Great question, great, and great observations in your question. Let me just start, first start by saying, and I'm not a religious person, and so I don't mean to be offensive to anyone's religion, but let me just say that nothing is ever totally true. That's where history comes in. Um, if there were totally true things, we wouldn't need history. We would just live in the same time and space and reproduce that. Um, I grew up in a generation in which it was said that the atom is the smallest particle. It can never be um, created or destroyed. Now, the Greeks, I think, came up with that thousands of years ago. No one had ever seen the atom. So I'm, I was born in 1947, so I, you know, this is not the 1800s, 1700s. No one had ever seen the atom, but the world was organized around the principle of atoms. Any physicists in the room? All right, tell us what a quark is. It's a particle smaller than an atom, smaller than an <laughs> electron or a proton within each of those particles. Tell us what a subquark is. Now, see, he just destroyed the truth that my, that my generational cohort was raised up on because looking historically, trying to figure out what did we not know, we, we think we knew some things, and going back and continuing to try to interpret that, we get to subquarks, and we may even be on subquarks now. So first of all, nothing is ever totally true. Here's something else about history, and it's really important for your age cohort. I don't mean to sound ageist, but, <laughs> and I don't think this is a risk about what I'm about to say. One of the characteristics, I would say, all over the world of young adults is we want totalizing answers. We want the truth. We want the unadulterated truth. My 31-year-old cannot deal with nuance. It's either right, morally, or it's wrong. There is no in-between. There are no qualified explanations for him. So he sometimes has a hard time measuring progress. Now, this is a James Early metaphor, so if you use it, please quote me. It's probably the only way I'll get in print. We should always look for the pinheads of light and try to turn them into skies. It's always dark out there. The pinheads of light are the little steps that we have accumulated over the course of human existence to get together in this room. There are more young women in this room than there are men. Let's not get into the color ethnicity question for a moment. That is a fundamental democratic advance in a country with a lot of virtues that has been and still is fundamentally sexist. All you have to do is go to see what the income levels are. And Hillary Clinton was, in my view, disingenuous to discover, oh, look at all the sexism uh, in the country. All you had to do was go to look at who went to Harvard at the same time, had the same grades, or she, meaning any woman, had better grades, but look on average what she's being paid to the man. Uh, so. We have a long ways to go, and there's always, there will always be fight backs. But the fact that young people like yourselves, and I know some people will disagree with this, came out of the closet and said, put up a sign, and went to a demonstration and said, I am an illegal. Um, you know, before 9-11, there was something called the cedula. It's a, it's a credit, it's a, it's a identification card from Mexico. There were several country, several um, state jurisdictions in the Southwest who were using this card for emergency identification. A woman is having a baby on a bus. 
um, she's speaking with an accent, or she appears to be the other. She is undocumented or illegal. But when the police get that identity card, what they are interested in, how do we contact her family? Does she need a blood transfusion? We're not going to deal with the undocumentation or the illegalness. Um, that is, in a man I'll give you a metaphor. Um, that's like a birthing moment. We're trying to break through old restrictions, but we're being held back by existing restrictions. That's how democracy comes. That's what the Civil Rights Movement was about. That's what the gay and lesbian movement um, is about. That is how the other ableness, what the other ableness movement um, um, uh, is, a, is, a, is about. So yes, we have many, many challenges with the racist backlash, and we are seeing a racist backlash in this country. For all of you who got so elated with the Barack so-called post-racialist moment. I was not one of them. I actually wrote and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, we now see uh, the role of racism um, in this. I was in a board meeting a couple of weeks ago at the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, which is a very liberal, sometimes described as left, but it's just really very liberal think tank, a board I chaired for several years way, way back. And uh, our colleagues were disappointed with the midterm elections. And um, they said, you know, we have to come up with a better explanation for these people in the Tea Party. I said, no, we have to tell them that what they're feeling is true. They are losing their country as they conceive it. It is never going to be, well, one can never say never. <laughs> but for a very, very long time into the future, it is never going to be, again, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant dominant. By 2050, when you will be how old? OK. We had some math calculators in here? OK. <laughs> the country uh, will be majority non-white. I don't want to get stuck on skin color again. The index is who will it be culturally? We will all be Americans, but we will be very multicultural in our ways of worshiping, our, our taste, uh, our clothing. Uh, we had the debates at the Smithsonian when they were going to fire a woman in the 80s. Be, she was a guard because her hair was plaited. Um, stupid on the part of the Smithsonian because um, the Hyatt, I think it was, had just lost the case three months <coughs> earlier by a, a woman. That's a cultural question of aesthetics. If you have fine blonde hair and you like that, I'm glad you like it. If you've got cornrows and you like that, I'm glad you like it. Those are, those are not genetic propositions except for the quality of hair. But those are historically evolved aesthetics standards of beauty. This is what multiculturalism uh, is about. That every society has notions of good, truth, and beautiful. Now, I'm not into relativism. Um, I don't want to say that you can do everything with my culture that you can do with your culture. Uh, but in the circumstances in which one has lived, and that circumstances have changed now because we're a globally integrated world, and you have to start to ask yourselves, what is my global citizenship, not just what is my national citizenship? You have to break with this US politicians who think it's a virtue not to have a passport. Or uh, when I was a 19-year-old studying in Central America in Panama, and I was around GIs in these eight military bases doing my field research in the bars on, in the evening, because <laughs> I was their age. And they would say, hey, man, I'm going to the world next week. And I thought that very curious. And years later, I reflected on it. The world was the United States. Panama was not the world. Um, that has now changed because we live in a globally interconnected world, having a lot to do with the flow of economics. Uh, and the flow of economics also gets the flow of labor. The problem is, is that it's unequal. Um, you know, no one wakes up in, how many of you been to Guatemala? No one wakes up in beautiful Guatemala, no one at level of scale, and says, you know what, I'm going to go live in Chicago for the rest of my life. 
Uh, that's an economic issue, generally speaking. Of course, people make individual decisions. So anyway, look at it in that context. I was too long. Any? Yes, sir. Wait a minute, let me get my crystal ball first. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, good, it's good to be torn about these questions because, um, you know, ideology is pure and uh, harmonious, uh, and it always gives you the answer that you want. <laughs> Politics is messy. And... Um, you know, you do things that your ideology says you should not do, you know. You should not put your hands on your children, uh, and maybe you won't, but then you'll have a bad thought. One day I would really want to shake, you know. You see, it's, so it's, it's, it can be torturous. Um, I think in each case, you have to examine the particularities of each case, and you have to look at them in historical frame. How did the country get to be the way it was? What are the issues of fairness and justice? Who have been the players and who have not been? It doesn't answer the question, but it gives you a better optic to make qualitative judgment about that circumstance and not to confuse it with Cuba or Bolivia uh, or the Soviet Union uh, or the socialist republics that existed. Um, in the case of Venezuela. Venezuela was, um, if I recall correctly, Venezuela may have actually started OPEC, the oil-producing da-da-da countries. Um, just unbelievable wealth in some areas of Venezuela and just astounding poverty in other areas. I went there first in 1972 and then I went a number of times, and then I went back in 2003 with Danny Glover, the ACTA activist with whom I do a lot of work, the president of the board of the Trans-Africa Forum. And a number of white Venezuelans would stop us in the very modern airport and, you know, with their children, their grandchildren, aunts and uncles, and they wanted his autograph, they knew his movies, you know, and they would talk to him about his movies. And they were just very elated. There was just no hint of any racial issue. And then, this happened a number of times at the end. They would say, so why are you here talking about racism? We don't have any issues of racism here. <laughs> and so James Early, the sidekick, would say, um, do you know that some black Venezuelans invited us here? Do you know that there are 23 organized Afro-Venezuelan uh, uh, communities uh, that there is a red de Afro-Venezolanos and Afro-Venezuelan network, and they work with Mundo Afro and Uruguay and Geledes, which is a Yoruba term for strong black religious woman, the largest black women's organization in Brazil, and I could go on and on and on. These were nice people. Their whiteness did not make them bad people, but they did not, this is what socialization can do. So in the case of Venezuela, um, I am generally positive, and in that context, I have my critiques. I've spent some quality time, two, three of us, on a number of occasions with Hugo Chavez. He is a very smart man. Do not let, do not let his macho-ness, um, um, his sexism, all of which I have raised questions about when he said that the problem with Condoleezza Rice was that she needed a man. I said, you know, what kind of sexist bull? I mean, what, that, is, that, is, that is straight up sexism, and it's not just at the level of offensive wording. Uh, men will go out and organize society around those propositions. We have, and we unfortunately, in so many cases, still do. Uh, I think he's getting somewhat better at his statecraft, um, but he is smart as a fox in building these relationships around the world based on notions of justice. 
Having said that, you should keep your eye on him and critique him at every moment, and you don't have to take a position unless you want to take a position. Um, Cuba, probably my favorite place. I've been going there for 30, um, 36 years. I go maybe two, three times, sometimes four times a year for different, different kinds of projects and for politics that I've been involved in. Have done some extraordinary things. Uh, how many are, of you are into ballet? Oh, a few. Okay, you can admit it. You can admit it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, the world's leading male ba ballet dancer is a black man. Anybody know that? Ever, ever heard of the name Lair, uh, uh, Carlos um, Acosta? Um, I was involved in a film project. He's a, he was a break dancer, poor community in Cuba. The neighbors say um, when the bananas came out, he stole the bananas. When the papayas came out, he stole the papayas. The teacher said, you know, we'd be looking for him and we'd have to call his working class father. He'd be down at the bridge all day swimming. Um, his father made him go to ba ballet school. And um, the report said, you know, the first things that they showed us how to do, no one could do it. Carlos did it perfectly. Uh, he's now the world's leading male ballet dancer, world ballet of, of um, London. Right now he's in Cuba doing a tour in all provinces. He says he can't live without going back to Cuba. He's not a communist. Um, the uh, Cuba has, uh, look at the UN stats. Um, they rank with developing countries. Their children score off the chart in math and science. Now, are they any better than our children? Or is that will and putting your resources somewhere? But the homophobia in Cuba is renowned. They were one of the most backward countries when it came to issues of sexual freedom. Uh, they are now making amends. Uh, people said, all my left friends, including all my black left friends, there is no racism in Cuba. Well, I started writing about that very early. You can find stuff that I wrote on Afro-Cuba web. I'm a big fan of Cuba, but there is racism in Cuba, and it's a fundamental democratic question because it's a transversal question. It affects all of the elements of life. If you're a woman, if you're gay, if you're rural, if you're working class, if you got cancer, um, you know, that happens. It's like if you are a woman, that's a transversal question. You know, just about anything that can go wrong, you find the women in rural areas and the children and you will see the most concentrated negativism of what can go wrong, whether it's here in the United States or whether it's in Haiti. And so um, <coughs> Bolivia is a most interesting question to look at in the context of dealing with this crisis and participatory culture, democracy, and the like, because there is some debate, but basically Bolivia is a little over half indigenous. And so the whole concept of the modern nation state is under review uh, because they have, a cosmo they have cosmologies that have uh, a, particularly a major one, uh, a worldview, a spirituality, uh, a notion of their relationship to nature, uh, which has not been paradise. People do cut down trees and, and indigenous people were killing one another long before they saw a European. So it's not like you know they were just sort of walking around in a little idyllic space. But they were not killing each other at the level of scale uh, that after Europeans got here. And not all Europeans were doing that, because uh, Europeans were killing one another uh, in, in Europe. So I mean, it's, it, there are universals here. But it is a most interesting place to look at from the vantage point of ways of knowing and doing, and how you take these millenarium uh, cultural and cosmological perspectives and deal with contemporary technology and the, the, the modern world. So um, somebody will have to stop me, but. Yeah. Can I maybe one more question? Yes, ma'am. I think that um, as much as we want to open up different ways of knowing and doing, uh, the reality is still there. possible but it's really difficult because it will limit you somehow. You cannot do uh, math and art and dance and uh, many things that you really want to do. You want to use your imagination but it's not possible. You really have to give
be real. You need it's life. It's real life. Uh, so you want to learn as well. I mean, I want to learn. I I wish I could learn all my life and not have to worry about getting a job and paying for stuff. But <laughs> it's difficult because you have to live, right? So um, you come to school, you have to choose a major, and that's it. You cannot mix uh, science and dance. I mean, you can try, but you really have to struggle to balance everything you want to do. So different ways of knowing, that's great. That's really, I, I guess everybody wants to do that, but um, it's difficult to do because you have to um, assure a future. You have to think about the money. Money is the issue always. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a good probably point to to try to conclude on. Um, life is always a struggle. Um, all you have to do is read uh, the profiles of some of the most celebrated people in this society or any society uh, who were wealthy, who had all of the material um, needs at their disposal, um, and they suffer the same kinds of tragedies and the like that we suffer. There is, there is no paradise on earth, so you do have to struggle. And every society has to establish norms, uh, modes of behavior, comportment, uh, in order to try to keep some balance uh, such that it does not become anarchistic and violent and ultra-selfish that, you know, I'll just take what I want and if you can. But having said that, you can do whatever you decide you want to do, generally speaking. But you make choices. You make compromises. And I'm going to, I don't want to um, overly endow my example, but I do need to say this to Julie, who, who uh, respectfully has Dr. Early, Dr. Early, Dr. Early. Um, and I used to joke saying, my mother must have called and said, you know, if you call him doctor two or three times, maybe he'll go back and um, retake those comps that he flunked <laughs> and actually get the doctorate. Um, I don't really need it now. I'm not sure I needed it then. I'm not sure I knew what I was doing studying for a PhD in history anyway. I have one degree. Now, this is not to suggest that you should now run uh, and leave school. Um, but there are many more like me for different reasons. I can't, my story is not their story, but I'm just suggesting to you that you can do many different things and reach levels of success. I have a very good income. I have a fairly solid reputation in a good part of the world, um, but one degree. Uh, that degree is in Spanish. For years, I would not say that. I can do anything I want to in Spanish. And I wouldn't say it because I run into young people like you, and I listen to you speak Spanish, and I say, my goodness. But you know the difference between me and you is maturity. I know how to negotiate more things in life than you do because I've been around longer. That's the only difference. And so even when I hear you speak the language or read the language or write the language better than I do, I have the advantage of having gone through some experiences. Um, my 31-year-old came to me a few months ago, and he says, Pops, got any advice? We sit down, we go to busboys and ports once a week, have a beer. And um, I said, yeah, I want you to write at least one poem a year, because you're used to write beautiful poetry. And I said, I want you to do one drawing a year, because you really used to draw very well. Now, he spends all of his time writing scripts, and he's studying two or three plays, making no money, but he's on stage all the time. Um, I'm trying, to, and he really wants to be, he think he wants to be like me, and in some ways, I guess I'm buying a little into it and saying, you know what, you can be like me if you figure out how to calibrate your life, but you're going to have to make some sacrifices. So you're going to have to figure out those are, how much money do you need? That's a rhetorical question. Um, how many people, this is not a rhetorical question, how many people do you know who are living relatively well but who are the most unhappy, distempered people you've ever run into <laughs> because they have not found a sense of well-being? I don't, 
spiritual well-being. Now, religion can provide that in some instances, but when I use the term spiritual, I'm not talking about religion. It can be doing yoga. You know, I go into Rock Creek Park on the weekends when I'm here, and I may stay out there three hours just walking in the woods, because that's what I did as a kid. And, you know, it um, gives me my physical exercise, and it gives me my, my, my spiritual uh, balance. So you can subvert these narrow protocols uh, that says stay in your place. And the fact that you are all in this room, look, just look around at yourselves for a moment. 30 years ago, you would not have been in this room. And I would not have been in this room. And somebody broke those protocols. Um, so it can be, that, that's what living is about. Um, that's what the imagination, you know, why have an imagination if you can't think of new ways of doing something? I mean, it's, it's, it's and we, we are dumbed down because in this society and in many Western societies and increasingly in non-Western societies, the imaginative people are those dancers, those twinkly toed boys over there, or those uh, guys who walk around wanting to paint all the time, or the girl who's playing the flute. Uh, those are the imaginative people, but the serious people are studying technology and wanting to become a banker and, and open up a uh, janitorial service. Um, well, you have to break that mode, and, uh, but you have to use this, and you have to pat yourself on the back for every inch that you gain in life. Because it is a long, winding journey. And sometimes it can be torturous. And your cohort group, your age group, tends to think, if I could just do this perfectly, it doesn't work that way. Uh, you have to fall. You have to stumble. You have to scrape your leg. Uh, and learn from that of, you know, I, people say, how are you doing, James? I said, I'm stumbling with rhythm. Because <laughs> uh, I know I'm going to stumble, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get some value uh, out of this old world and not just have that ideal up against that I have not yet hit that mark. If you don't enjoy the journey, I guarantee you, if you hit the mark, you won't enjoy it. Just look at these athletes, you know, they work hard, hard, and then they get $10, $12 million in their pocket so they can just buy more $12 million in the worst case scenarios of what they were already undermining their lives with. It's not quality. And of course, they don't tell you about Bernard King, you know, who has a great painting collection. You know, the guy who played for one of the Washington teams and was an outstanding athlete for the New York Knicks. You don't even hear his name. It has an extraordinary connection. You don't uh, hear about the memorabilia uh, connection of who's the guy out of Michigan with the Fabulous Five who's now, who is the center, who's now an announcer. Come on, you African jump ball fans. Chris Weber. Chris Weber. They don't tell you that Chris Weber has a wonderful memorabilia collection. Well, he's following his spirit, you know. He, he didn't buy like nine Jaguars or, uh, you know, <laughs> or something like that. So, so, Look at it that way, and um, let me stop there and um, just say that I really never got around to closing the issue on social movements and um, <laughs> democracy in Latin America and the U.S. It just when I looked out at you and thought about who you were, uh, but I hope some of the terminology that I was using in that other narrative uh, has been uh, useful for you to reflect on. I hope it's been provocative for you to some of you leave frustrated and angry and be thinking about, okay, so what am I going to do about that descriptor that he gave? And, you know, it's your world. And um, go out and do something with it. Don't accept what we have left for you. Thank you.